All right, so here we are, number two in the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, God is turning on the lights and he's causing us to see things differently. And it's all in this last book of the Bible, right? It's called the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. We learned that last week, right? Did you learn it? Are you seeing it in your life? Is your life a revelation of Jesus Christ? I mean, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so God not only wants to show us something, but he wants to show something through us. He wants our life to be a revelation. I mean, he said at one time, I'm the light of the world. But then he turned around to his disciples and he says, as long as I'm in the world. But now you are the light of the world. In other words, we're to cause a revelation. Even in the darkest place, we're to shine. Amen? Yeah? So we're not just talking head knowledge here. We're talking about uh, a walk with a, the living God, with a, the living person of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. And that can change our lives. I believe it is so vital in this day. Uh, like we looked at the different responses that people had to this book. And some people are afraid of it. Some people are obsessed with it because they think that uh, they can figure out all the stuff that's going to happen in the future. But God wants us to know that the future is in his hands and he's on the throne and everything's going to be all right because he can work everything together for good. Have you seen that? in your life. So we don't have to be fearful in looking at this book, but God is looking for a, a, a positive response, a response of faith that uh, as we looked at chapter 4, he says, come on, come higher, I want to show you things. I want to show you Jesus Christ and I want to show you your life in Jesus Christ. I mean, that's a good invite, isn't it? You know, that's an adventure to life in all of its fullness the way that he has it. And so then we kind of ended off and with a, a puzzle. And that's how some people look at their life. They look at it like a puzzle. And a whole bunch of pieces that are unrelated, they're lying on the table, and uh, yeah, what do you do with the puzzle? Well, first of all, you take all the pieces, you dump them out of the box. And then you turn them all over. I mean, some people pe spend all of their lives just trying to turn the pieces over. I mean, imagine if you're looking at the back side of the puzzle. <laughs> It's a pretty bleak picture. <laughs> and so God wants us to look at the front side. You turn them all over. And what do we need? We need the big picture. Okay? And thank God we've got, you know, not just a picture on a box like a natural puzzle, but this is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's a person. And, and this is the picture. Corinthians said, uh, this is the image of God. This is the face of God to us. In Christ was the face of of the Father. Uh, in the Old Testament, they couldn't look on the face of God. They thought they'd die. <laughs> but now in Jesus Christ, we have the face of God. And then he actually says that we're being changed. We are being changed into that same image. Can you see that? Okay, Turn to somebody and say, you're being changed. I'm being changed. Okay? I want us to get involved in this. <laughs> you know, this is no theological, academic discussion where we're going to, you know, well, I think, you know. No, come on, it's a, the revelation of Jesus Christ to us and through us. And this book is alive. And so it's not just a matter of my life is a bunch of pieces on the table. And if I can only try to figure them out, well, you need the big picture. The big picture is Jesus. But don't try to put God in the box. <laughs> God will always break out, like I said. It's called, they tried to do that one day, and it's called the resurrection. <laughs> Jesus will always break out. You can't put limitations on him. So naturally, when you've got a puzzle, and you've got all the pieces there, and you've looked at the picture, and you've got the right picture for the right puzzle, what's the first pieces you're going to try to put together? The corners, the edges. But you can't do that in the spiritual puzzle of life. <laughs> you can't put edges to Jesus. You can't put limitations. So instead of starting with the outside perimeter, look for the center. And the centerpiece is Jesus Christ. <laughs> Focus on him. It's a whole new life. When you got saved, you became a whole new creation. And it was simply by receiving Christ. Where? In your toes? In your fingers? No. Symbolically, it's in your heart. <laughs> Amen? Right at the center of your being. And that's what changes. It's a whole new life. You've moved 
from the mystery of a whole bunch of pieces of your life scattered, random, on a table, trying to fit it together. How do you do with puzzles? Do you, are you patient? Are you impatient? <laughs> do you try to make the pieces fit? <laughs> Maybe you take a hammer to the things. <laughs> I'm not just saying a natural puzzle. What about your life? You're trying to put the pieces of your life together? Do you always need to be in control? <laughs> or... When you start with the centerpiece and his name is Jesus, then he shows you the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you into one piece at a time to put them all together. And that moves you. That's the revelation of the cross, how vital it is in our life. And it moves us from that which was mystery in the Old Testament to now revelation in the New Testament, the New Covenant. Uh, this is this is something that takes place by the Word and the Spirit. You can't just have one without the other. you got to take the Word of God. Like I say, uh, we started out saying, let the Word of God speak. Let the Bible speak for what it's really going to say. Uh, put aside your prejudices, your presumptions, your traditions, what you've been taught already, and just let... The Word of God speak. I hear a lot of people say, I can't hear the Father's voice. Maybe because it's too, your, your mind is too filled with your own thoughts. <laughs> you know, get empty at least. Be honest. Come to God. Say, Jesus, I don't know anything about life except you are the life. That's a good start, isn't it? Yeah, and then let him begin to put the pieces together. Now, we're going to look at seven steps from mystery to revelation tonight. Uh, I believe there is, well, I chose seven because seven is God's number, <laughs> okay? But you won't find this, I don't know, in any textbook or whatever. Um, I've been working on them, and they've been changing because it's an order of life. This is not a formula, but there's some guidelines here in how we're going to interpret this book. Why? Because in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it. When we look at signified, there was a little word in signified. Sign. Signs and symbols. Okay? So in other words... God is using signs and symbols, not literal things. When it means a beast, when it says a beast, you don't necessarily have to look for a beast with seven horns and ten heads, or ten horns and ten heads and seven horns. Uh, it's not a literal thing. It's a symbolic book. He sent and signified it. So we've got to have some consistent interpretation because... Uh, we get a hundred people in this room, you get at least 102 different interpretations. So there's got to be a standard here. So I want to look at that tonight. How we put the jigsaw puzzle together. How we put the pieces together. Not forcing them, but allowing them to grow right from the center, which is the, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, but seeing it grow and be, fill the big picture, and not just uh, in our lives, but in the earth. I believe this, this book speaks. It speaks now, it speaks forever, and it speaks life. Can we start from there? Sure. Yeah? All right. Okay, so we need true and consistent interpretation of these signs. This is called hermeneutics, if you want the technical term. It means just Bible interpretation. How do you, take, how do you let the Word of God speak? And uh, there's some principles here. And guess what the number one is? The first principle has got to be centered on Jesus. Oh, Henry, you're being too spiritual. <laughs> no, I tell you, this is practical. <laughs> it needs to be centered, focused, looking unto Jesus, the Bible says, again and again and again. It's not about a whole bunch of different doctrines and revelations. It's one revelation. It's called the revelation of? Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's what, that's what we need to focus on. Uh, people always have had a problem with this. I mean, on the day of resurrection, if you go to Luke 24, 
in your Bibles. If you got your word there, right? Luke 24, day of resurrection. Uh, people should have been rejoicing because Jesus told them that he was not only going to die, but he was going to raise from the dead. Did they understand that? Did they believe that? No. <laughs> Two of the disciples are walking the other direction on resurrection day. And instead of rejoicing, they were downcast. And Jesus joined them. And he said, well, what's going on? And they rehearsed all the stories. But the way they were interpreting it was very negative. It was like, oh man, he died, and we thought he was the Messiah, and then this morning some women show up, and uh, you know, you can't trust the testimony of women, that's the way it was in the Old Testament, and these women say that he's risen from, well, his, his body's missing. <laughs> See, they take bits and pieces, but they don't relate them together, and then you end up with sadness, despair, gloom and doom. <laughs> And uh, it says here that Jesus began to talk to them and he says, uh, you know, really, you're not relating these bits of information together, right? You know, if he was really the Christ, then shouldn't he have suffered these things and then entered into his glory? Well, I never thought about that. <laughs> and then it says, verse 27, Luke 24, 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets... In other words, that's the Old Testament. Take your Bible. That's the whole Old Testament. He says, beginning there, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. <laughs> Jesus, you are either very self-centered or you are who the Bible reveals you to be. God and nothing less. God became man. Amen? Amen. Okay. Now, don't just take one scripture for it. Go over the page. Verse 44. Well, my Bible is over the page. He shows up later on in Jerusalem to his disciples. And they're all hiding in a room. He shows up and walks through the wall, and all of a sudden there he is. And it says, you know, don't be troubled about this. All things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. me. <laughs> I mean, if you do not start with the centerpiece of Jesus, then you miss all the rest, you're not relating it together. And this is something that we need to really see because, unfortunately, we get so distracted. A lot of the church is distracted these days. They're distracted with doctrines about what it's going to look like in the so-called end times, uh, what we'll have to do, what the church's place in the world should be right now. Uh, or all of a sudden we get distracted with signs and wonders and uh, we don't know whether they're real signs and wonders. I mean, come on, let's keep it simple. Keep your focus on Jesus. Jesus. Well, somebody says it's too spiritual. No, it isn't. If you're born again, you're born again by faith in Jesus. In the same way you're born again, that's how we should walk. Amen? The way it starts, the way it continues, is also the way that it's going to come into fullness. Now, the religious mind doesn't really understand this. In John chapter 5, verse 39. I'll give you these three scriptures. You look at them. He's talking to the Pharisees of his day, the people who had all the information. It was like the computers. You feed in all the information, but does your computer relate it together? Is it able to put the pieces together and come up with the right answer? Well, they said, we know all about Messiah Jesus, and you're not him. <laughs> Why? Well, because you heal on the Sabbath, you work on the Sabbath, and you call your father God. I mean, those are things to get stoned. Yeah, a religious mind will stone you for those things. You're getting too close to God. <laughs> so he says to them, you know, Pharisees, you search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. John 5.39 Well, that's right. The Scriptures have eternal life. Amen? But what's the key? He says, But these, these are they which testify of me. <laughs> in other words, you can't get away from it. If you're going to, uh, if you're going to seek to have a, a life that is a life born again, it's, it's constantly, it starts with a focus on Jesus, it continues, and it, that's the way it continues and continues. <laughs> Forever and ever. So that's a good place to start, amen? Jesus says that's the difference between a religious rules and regulation and a real personal walk of faith. So I think it's really important to have that first piece. 
that it really is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because otherwise we can get very confused. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I, I believe that's very practical. He's the way. He's the way to walk in. He's the truth. You don't have to worry about funny stuff. He's going to speak life, and yeah, that's what it produces, is life. Uh, I like puzzles. I like mysteries. I like a challenge. But I also like the revelation <laughs> to come somewhere along the line. I like to have a resolution. I like to see the big picture come actu into actuality. Uh, when I was in university, I started, oh, we do puzzles as a family. Well, I, I'd, we'd all start them, and I'd end up finishing them. But uh, I got this one puzzle, and I come home from university, and I got this one puzzle. You know what it was? It was a picture of a blue and white sailing ship on blue and white sea with blue and white sky and clouds behind it. Dominant colors, blue and white. <laughs> and all the pieces were the same shape. <laughs> and so it was quite a test to try and find out which pieces fit together. So I was doing pretty good, but I didn't get it finished at Christmas time, and I came home on the weekends, and I'd work on it. And I actually had it on a big piece of plywood. It was a big puzzle. I think it was 2,500 pieces. Wow, talk about a life. And, uh, and so I'd have it on this plywood uh, uh, sheet, and I, I kept it downstairs. And when you know, one day I came home, one weekend I came home, we had a cat. And this cat liked to sleep on my puzzle. And I opened the door and I surprised the cat. And the cat dug its claws in and proceeded to run across the room with pieces of my puzzle going, you know, like two months work. And I'm going, ah! And I proceeded to put them all back together again. And I persisted. And I think probably two months later, I finished my puzzle, except one piece was missing. And you know where it was? Right in the center. <laughs> I mean, it's not off to the side that it's kind of like, oh, well, we can ignore that. You know, and, and our lives are like that without Jesus. <laughs> you know, you can work on the periphery, you can work on the edge, but in the spiritual life, it's different. We start in the center. You got it? <laughs> you got it? Has he got you? Okay, well, let's proceed then into the next one here. The next one is in context. It's got to be centered on Jesus, and it's got to be in context. Now, this is, uh, this is one people play around with a lot, especially these days. Uh, context means con with text. It's like textiles woven together. You know, you weave it together and it can be a, a good fabric, it can be a, a nice curtain, it can be a warm coat, uh, but it's all in how you're going to weave it together and how strong that's going to be. That's what context means. This is the first simple. It's connecting all these thoughts. It's joining these pieces together in the puzzle. Now, text, context means within the text, but a text, like a verse in the Bible, out of context is a pretext. What's well, a pretext? An evasion from the truth. <laughs> and people are doing all sorts of stuff these days, taking verses right out of context and trying to make them say things. And especially, they do this, I believe, with the book of Revelation and different parts of the book. And I say, it's time to look at it in context and put pretext away. Evasions from the truth, distractions. Okay? But we do this all the time. We're in an age of sound bites. What do I mean? Well, most of your newscasts are like 20 second segments of somebody saying something. Did they say that, really? Or did they just take, did the newscasters take what was good for their story <laughs> and present it in a way that wasn't the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Uh, examine sometimes what people feed you. Maybe they just tell you what they want you to hear. <laughs> and maybe they just they say, well, if I can feed them this info, they'll be on my side. Um, misquotes. You know, people say, so-and-so said that. I, <laughs> I didn't really say that. Get it in the context. Okay, I can show you. I can prove anything from this Bible. I can prove by this Bible 
If all you had to do is just stick with an intellectual, academic approach to the Word of God, I can prove that there is no God. Some of you should be jumping up and down throwing rocks now. <laughs> what? He's going to prove there is no God. Yeah, come on. Go to Psalm 14, verse 1. Psalm 14, verse 1. Come on. Look at it. There it says. Verse 1. There is no God. Right? Isn't that right? But the context is. <laughs> Henry, read the whole verse. Who said... There is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So if you're going to give me a scripture, a phrase, out of context, you could end up making it say the very opposite from what it's meant, and you could end up being a fool. Who wants to be a fool here? Nobody. <laughs> right? Okay, here's another one. Uh, all men are liars. Yeah, oh, it's true. Go to Psalm 116, verse 11. Psalm 116, it says, all men are liars. Right in verse 11 there. Got it? Oh, but I forgot one thing. It said, I said in my haste, <laughs> all men are liars. In other words, I jumped to a conclusion ahead of time. And I, I stereotyped people. Well, most people do lie sometime in their life. But are they always liars? I mean, a Christian should be somebody who not only tells the truth, but lives the truth. Amen? Yeah. Okay, uh, this, is, uh, th this is not controversial enough. Uh, here, th this is what the Bible said. Uh, women keep silent in the church. Oh, come on, women. <laughs> Ladies. <laughs> well, what's that? First Corinthians. <laughs> chapter 14, you silent. <laughs> First Corinthians, chapter 14, verse 34. Exactly. Let your women keep silent in the church. However, there's a whole cultural context here of Greek culture at that time where the women would sit on one side and the men on the other side. And women just didn't have the education in those days. Well, men didn't have much either, but they had a little bit more. And so if the preacher is preaching in the church and the women didn't understand what was happening or what he was saying, so Erica would holler over and say, Hey, Henry, <laughs> what is he saying? I don't know. And it's confusion. So in other words, let's keep it silent. Ask the questions later on at home. That's what it, It's just a cultural thing, but we yank it out of context, and we say, well, women, ladies, you can play the piano, and that's it. <laughs> you know, we come up with doctrines, we come up with uh, uh, behaviors that are enforced that don't bring the glory of God. It's got to be in context. Amen? Okay, so... 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. It says we need to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. You cannot judge a spiritual move, God moving by the Holy Spirit, by your own natural opinion and understanding. We need to judge, compare spiritual with spiritual. What does that mean? Well, Jesus said, uh, Jesus has a way of saying difficult things to us. <laughs> like just when the party's really going, he turned around to all the disciples and he said, uh, except you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And it says, everybody except the twelve walked away. <laughs> and they were kind of scratching their heads. And he says, you going too, Peter? And he says, well, where can we go? You have the words of life. They are spirit and they are life. So, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, Scripture interprets Scripture. You cannot just take one Scripture, yank it out of context, and make it say something. The Mormons did that with those who were baptized for the dead. And we've got a funny doctrine now that if you get baptized for somebody who died, then they'll be saved. That's, that's not... The kingdom of God. <laughs> okay, so let's say it. Scripture interprets scripture. with feeling this time. Scripture. <laughs> yeah. I ask you to repeat it because 
when it gets in our heart and in our minds, you know, rather than just swallow what somebody else told me, I, I, I heard people say this kind of thing. Well, it must be true. I read it in a book. Uh, I got it off the internet. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> There's all sorts of stuff on the internet, okay? In other words, is it really true? Exegetically. Oh, yeah, there's a big word. Exegesis means let the word of God speak. <laughs> That's all it means. And if you, it's like, wow, if we have two lights here, we got more light. We got two speakers, we got stereo. Okay? Two or three witnesses need to word, work together. They need to witness together. That's God's standard. Okay? So, uh, what did the scripture originally mean then? When he wrote it. In the original. Who wrote it? Who's the author? Who was he writing it to? When did he write it? How? Was it a letter? Was it a, was it a video? Whatever. Uh, well, why did he write it? Now, this all comes together for something called setting. And we need the proper setting. You can have a flashy diamond ring, beautiful diamond. It's the setting that should enhance the diamond, hold it in place, and actually it's like a frame on a picture. It shouldn't take away from the picture. It should just cause your focus to come in on the picture, right? Now, I believe it's the same thing with the Word of God and with the setting of Revelation. Uh, who, to whom, when, how, where, why, time and place are the big things. Okay? Uh, everybody's trying to figure out their destiny. <laughs> destiny is a combination of two things. Your time and your place. Which way are you going and are you in step? <laughs> are you in time? And in figuring out the setting, time and place are essential. Uh, there's a lot of, well, let's look at time first. The date of the writing of this book, Revelation. Now, there's a big confusion. Uh, depending on how you see the timing is your perspective. That's how you're going to look at the rest of the book. And there's basically two camps. There's a late camp and an early camp. Early or late. Well, late. What do you mean? Well, about 96 AD. People say, oh, John was on Patmos in the last days of his life. He lived to about 95. And he was in Patmos. And it was later. Now, Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead about 30 AD. So this is about 66 years later. That's quite a long time. And there's an early date. And they say, no, it's before 70 AD. Well, so what's the diff? It's only 26 years. Well, something happened right here in 70 AD. It's called the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And some people say, depending on your perspective of when this book is written, either before or after, determines on the prophecies. Are the prophecies late? In other words, they can only refer to something way off in the future. Or are they before the destruction of Jerusalem? Our focus should be here. Okay? It's pretty important. It determines the way you look at the picture, the way you look at the book. Can you see that? Yeah? Okay. So, the emperor at the late date was a guy named Domitian. And the emperor, according to the early date, was an emperor named Nero. You've all heard of Nero before, right? Boo. <laughs> yeah, not a good guy. Okay? Um... The people who say, no, it's a late date, this is their argument. This has been the most popular argument since about 1900. They say, well, the worship of the emperor that's described in the book of Revelation, uh, it, could, it had to evolve. It needed time. It needed at least 66 years to evolve. Uh, persecution of the church. There wasn't enough time for this to really happen. Uh, so the, uh, some of the letters to these churches, like Laodicea, Man, they got pretty lukewarm <laughs> and needed more time for that to happen. Or, well, you're making assumptions. You're making presumptions on those. Uh, but basically, their basic argument is an external evidence one. Uh, there was a guy, he lived about 150 years after Christ. 
His name was Irenaeus. Okay, so that's quite a ways after. And uh, this guy actually wrote in a book, he wrote a phrase, said that was seen no longer, no very long time since, but also in our day, towards the end of Domitian's reign. Now they've got that little text, <laughs> and they say, well, that was in the end of Domitian's reign. Well, Domitian's reign was about 96 AD, so they say that was equals the book. The book of Revelation was written at the end of Domitian's time. Uh, but somebody else says, no, no, that was, really doesn't refer to the book, it refers to the man, the Apostle John. <laughs> he appeared at the end. He lived the longest of all the apostles. Um, they tried to persecute him, throw him into a bucket of boiling oil, he'd jump out. <laughs> they couldn't kill the guy. They put him on an island, man couldn't stop the Holy Spirit from coming to him and giving him the most dangerous book in our Bible. Because <laughs> it's a book of pictures of the glory of God. Okay? And, uh, but there's some, there's a lot of controversy about this. Now, this is external evidence. They say the book. They say this is evidence. This church father, Irenaeus, said that the book was written 96 AD. But I seriously question whether or not it's really saying that because it's saying the man lived until that long. In fact, I think the strongest one, it's not what John wrote, but it's who John was that we need to focus on here. But the strongest evidence is an internal evidence thing. So I want us to look at the, the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 9. Just really quickly, what we see here. Uh, he says, uh, I know the blasphemy, chapter 2, verse 9, of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Chapter 3, verse 9, says the same thing. In other words, there's people that are meeting in synagogues and they're calling themselves Jews, but John says, no, they're not real Jews, they're not true Jews, they're of the synagogue of Satan. The first persecution up until 70 A.D., when the city and the temple were destroyed, came from the Jews. It was the, the Saul's that persecuted the church, that hauled out the people from their homes and put them in prison and killed them. It wasn't until Nero's time that there was persecution by the Romans. Okay, So I believe, but the, one of the biggest is chapter 11. Look at this. He says, I was given a measuring rod. And here they're measuring the temple. The temple is the place where God dwells. Okay? He says, measure it. Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship there. He's talking about the temple of God that existed in Jerusalem. It was there only until 70 AD. This is in the present tense. In other words, the temple is still standing. And I believe this temple is being measured for destruction <laughs> by God. He's saying, I've sent my lamb <laughs> that has taken away the sins of the world. Your offerings are nothing to me anymore. <laughs> I've moved on to the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen? What is it? Who's the temple? Who's the temple of God right now? You are. Don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Amen? And then chapter 17. I'm going to bounce around a little bit, but I want to show the context. There's a passage here. and People argue over this. I believe it's very clear. It says, chapter 17, verse 10. There are seven heads, seven mountains, and seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. And we've got seven kings. Five have already been, one is, and one is will be at seven, okay? Well, it just so happens that up until this time of Nero, there had been five Caesars in Rome. What are their names? Julius, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius. Well, you don't know, take my word for it. Go check out the internet. <laughs> it's there. Okay, so five have fallen, one is. Well, the next emperor just happened to be Nero. 
Well, the one who is, in other words, that's the present time. I believe that's very conclusive evidence for when the book was written. <laughs> it was written while Nero was still alive. Nero died in about 66 AD. Committed suicide, took his own life. <laughs> So internally, I believe that we've got strong evidence of when the book was written. This is during Nero's reign. Now, he's the one that is. That's it. Okay, so we got, we got time there, the timing of the book. Now I want to look at the place. Go to chapter 3, verse 10. And here in the timing of this book, and the place of this book, he says, right at the end of verse 10, he's writing to the church of Philadelphia, he says, I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Okay, now, you take world and earth, right away, you'd kind of say, well, they mean the same thing, right? It means the globe. It means the world, the whole world. But that's not it. I mean, why do we have two different words? I mean, we can throw in globe, we can throw in universe, uh, the land, uh, all sorts of different words. Now, this is originally written in Greek, and there are two words that specify here, okay? And the one that says world is ecumene, and the one that says earth or land is a little word called ge, G-E, from which we get geology. Geography. Now, a lot of roots of our English language are in Greek. Okay. In other words, a study of the earth, a study of the rocks of earth. Okay. Now, world means something different from earth, especially in the context of this book. Okay. We're looking at time. Now we're looking looking at place. And if you would look at the place of what he's actually saying here. It's the context of the Roman world, which had the Mediterranean Sea right at the center. And so the whole Roman world was what was around the Mediterranean Sea. That was the Roman world. How do you know, Henry? Well, Scripture interprets Scripture, right? Okay, in chapter Luke, Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Very familiar passage from the Christmas story. And in this certain year, Caesar Augustus sent out a decree that all the world should be taxed. <laughs> well, Caesar Augustus, you're going to tax China? You're going to tax India? No, no, it's not the whole world. It's the Roman world. It's the context of the Roman world at that time. Okay, he says there's going to be a hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test those who are on the earth. And earth is one of the provinces of the Roman Empire, which was called Judea, where the Jews lived. Okay? So the world is the Roman Empire, and the earth, or the land, is Judea. He says there is going to be an empire-wide crisis that is going to have special stress on those who live in Judea. Well, somebody says, oh, I don't know about all that, Henry. That's pretty far-fetched. <laughs> well, check it out before you check it out. <laughs> um, it definitely helps to have this perspective because we're going to see other parts. Bear with us. Go come through the ten weeks and we'll check it out. You ready? Yeah? Okay, I want to show you how this works. Go to chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. Okay, now we found out that the world is the Roman Empire, the earth is Judea, right? Okay, Revelation chapter 10. It's a series of visions. Here's a vision. I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. Rainbow was on his head, his face was like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. He cried out with a loud voice, seven thunders uttered. Um, what is this all about? I mean, are we going to look in the future for some big angel to come down and bridge the land and the sea? Uh, no, I don't think so. What does the sea mean? What's our, what's our principle? Scripture interprets 
Scripture. Okay, keep your finger there. Go to chapter 17. Verse 15. Now he sees a harlot, a prostitute sitting on waters. And he says, oh, you want to know what the waters mean? You want to know what the seas mean? Chapter 17, verse 15. They are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. <laughs> In other words, these are the Gentile nations. And the land, or the earth, that's the Jews. What is he saying? Well, Paul says the gospel went first to the Jews and also to the Gentiles. This is an amazing revelation. In fact, then he lifts up his hand and he swears to him in heaven by two immutable purposes, the Word and Spirit of God. And he says, look at this, verse 6, that there should be delay no longer. Now some people say, time no longer. In other words, this is the end of time. Finally, this is the end of it. Now that's assuming, that's taking something out of context. Really, what he is saying is that this is the end of something. But not, definite, not specifically the end of the world. I believe it's the end of the Old Covenant. It's no more delay in bringing in the New Covenant. How do I know that? Okay. We said last week there was three books from the Old Testament we were going to look at. Books of visions. Which are they? Daniel. Daniel. Zechariah. Ezekiel. Now, if you go to Daniel chapter 10, you can see it right here. Daniel chapter 10. You compare Scripture with Scripture. And he says that, uh, verse 5, he lifted up his eyes and he saw this man. His waist was girded with the gold of a thaws, his body like barrel, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like a torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. What does that sound like? Remember last week? John was talking about Jesus, and then Jesus showed up. <laughs> he had a revelation of Jesus Christ like he'd never had before. I believe this angel, it doesn't always have to be a spiritual creature, is Jesus. And he comes, and the picture is, okay, the picture is he's bridging land and sea. The sea is the Gentiles, and the land is the Jews. He's bringing together both into the new covenant. I mean, that's a beautiful picture, just like that. A picture is worth a thousand words. Can you see it? There's people that are still saying, won't it be nice in the millennium when the Jews and the Gentiles are one body? you read your Bible? <laughs> it's already happened. The revelation is that it's at the cross. And it's right here in chapter 10 of Revelation and chapter 10 of Daniel. Go to chapter 12 of Daniel. So he gives them the revelation of the whole book. Okay, for next week I want you to read the book of Daniel. <gasps> A whole book? That's right. Stretch yourself. <laughs> okay? So you know ahead of time what we're looking at. Okay, he says, you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. That's chapter 12, verse 4. And uh, he looked and he saw two others, one on this riverbank and the other on that riverbank. I mean, he's doing the same thing as the angel, as Jesus is in doing Revelation chapter 10. One man said to the clothed, man clothed in linen who was above the waters, how long shall the fulfillment of these things be? And then I heard the man clothed in linen he held up his right hand towards heaven. It's the same picture as we've got in Revelation. What's happening? That which is in the Old Testament is being revealed in the New. And it's beyond anything that we could ask or think. Uh, he says here, uh, verse 8, he says, uh, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And if we take things out of context, we make a pretext and we think, oh, the end of the world. It's got to be the end of the world. But come back next week. <laughs> and we're going to see that it's the time of the end is the end of the Old Covenant. What? Exactly. Because he's saying, now there's no delay anymore. But Jew and Gentile have been bridged together in Jesus Christ. Can you see the picture? Yeah. Okay, go back to Revelation chapter 10. Just see it. What he's just saying here. He says, no more time. You know what that sounds to me like? It is finished! <laughs> Where did those words come from? 
Jesus on the cross. Was he saying, ah, I give up? <laughs> no! He's saying, it is finished. What I came to do, I've done. Well, what did he come to do? Okay, go to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm bouncing around a bit, sorry. But Ephesians chapter 3. What is the mystery? Everybody, you know, the mystery is my life and all these pieces, and I'm trying to get them together. We'll start with Jesus and do it in context. <laughs> and when you treat the Word of God and you treat your life, it'll come together in a beautiful picture. It will not be confusing. Ephesians chapter 3. Paul says here, verse 3, By revelation he has made known to me the mystery. You know, you can't look at the book of Revelation and go, you know, like it's all a mystery. To, no, no! The new is in the old, concealed, but the old is in the new, revealed. And he says here, it was a mystery, but now it's a revelation. And you read the rest of this passage, it's, it's very clear. He says, verse 6, it's now, or verse 5, it's now been revealed by the Spirit to His holy apostles that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of His promise in Christ. This is the picture we get in Revelation of this angel. He's bridging the earth, Judea, and the seas, the Gentile nations. Okay, go to Colossians chapter 1. He says the same thing. The mystery is Christ in you. I mean, that's pretty mysterious, isn't it? Wow, how did He get in here? But that was God's purpose all along, to let the Holy Spirit dwell inside us as temples. Temples of His presence. Okay, I want you to see this one more in three scriptures. You can look it up in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, but you go to the end of the book of Romans, and it's so clear here. The very last verses, Paul's perhaps greatest letter, fullest letter, and he writes here, he says, uh, verse 25, chapter 16, verse 25. He says, uh, this has been able to show the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. <laughs> so, rather than just focus on mystery, let's take a step further. He says, the gospel has taken that which was a mystery and made it a revelation. Kept secret since the world began. But now, everybody say now, <laughs> made manifest, in other words, it's shown, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. <laughs> There's the picture. So we're not dealing with a, a mystery anymore. We're dealing with revelation, and it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he's going to challenge our so-called end time doctrine. What is the end? When Jesus said it's finished, <laughs> he's pointing here to the cross. Something happened there. I want to know what it is. Amen? Yeah. Number three, it's got to be consistent. Yeah. It's got to be consistent with the rest of scriptures, doctrines throughout the whole Bible. Uh, John, the book of John says God is spirit. Uh, you cannot take another part of the revelation of the Bible and say God is an idol, a piece of stone, or an animal, or something like that. Okay, It's got to be consistent with other doctrines in the Bible. Uh, what about sin? Sin is something we're all born into. <laughs> sin is something that Jesus has set us free by His blood. Amen? What about hell? Heaven? Is there a hell or a hell? I, I hear people talking about all this. Well, what does the Bible say? Jesus doesn't talk about it figuratively. He says there's going to be torment in hell. That sounds like a, a real place. Uh, there are over 400, well, there's 404 verses here with over 500 allusions to the Old Testament. In other words, he's wanting to give us signs to show that have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. As I said, the new is in the old, concealed. It's a mystery. But now, Paul says, that which was a mystery has become a revelation. Do you see it? <laughs> so in other words, the signs, they're not spooky anymore. He's, he's shedding light on them. He's shining light on them. He's bringing them to the light. Okay? Now, we've got three more, four, four more I want to come through. Uh, first mention. 
Where in the Bible is it first mentioned? It's like a seed. You're going to get from there the revelation of what it's going to mean all the way through. Now, if we're looking at the Bible, what's going to be the book where most of these first mentions take place? Genesis, right? So let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, right? God created the heavens and the earth. Earth was out form and void. And then God said, let there be light. What's light? Light is not just turn on the lights. Light has become a symbol for something. I am the light of the world. What was Jesus saying? Illumination. Turn on the lights. It's about life. It's about uh, being able to see the truth. Then you go to verse 14. Let there be lights. Well, the sun, the moon, and the stars were the lights. But he says, to divide the day and the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, for days and years. In other words, this is how you're going to measure time. The stars, the sun, the moon, our calendars come from those things. These are signs. All of the signs point to Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 2. Numbers. Hey, what are numbers? Well, it says that God on the seventh day rested. What does seven mean? It means fullness. He came to a full conclusion and he stopped. <laughs> it means Shabbat, rest, the Sabbath. Seven. <laughs> seven is God's number of quality. Fully. Fully completed. It's done. He said it's very good. <laughs> right? Okay. What's six? Hmm. <laughs> six. 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 What does that mean? That's what everybody wants to know. Well, it's a symbolic number. Stick around. We'll go there. Uh, what about ten? Ten is God's number of quantitative fullness. In other words, there's quality in seven, there's quantity in ten. You do seven times ten, you got seventy. That's the number of the nations, all the, all the nations together. Uh, what's God's number? Seven. Yeah, that's God's number. The number of the Trinity, three, the fullness of the Godhead. Four is the number of the natural directions, north, south, east, west. Hey, I challenge you, good. go on an adventure this week. Check out some of these things as you're reading the Bible. Where do they show up first? Okay, uh, Serpent shows up in chapter 3. Who is he? Just a snake? I don't think so. The serpent is? Hello? <laughs> the devil! <laughs> it's Satan! And what else? The dragon. <laughs> the dragon shows up in Revelation. Uh, green! In chapter 1. That's God's favorite color. Did you know that? <laughs> it shows up first. What does green mean? Colors. Life. Life. Red. What does red mean? Black. Blood. Judgment. Black. Black. What does uh, white mean? Purity. purity. Okay, so we got white means purity. Everybody believes that? Do we agree with that? Okay, we'll go check it out. But uh, horse. Horse means? Strength. You can look up scriptures. Uh, Psalm says, some trust in chariots and some in horses. In other words, some trust in natural strength, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. So there's a, a horse doesn't just mean horse. A horse is a symbol of man's natural strength. Okay? And he says, you do not trust in that natural strength, but you trust in God. His spirit, the joy of the Lord, is our strength. Okay, horse means strength. Okay. Yeah, power, all of these things. Okay. So now we got white is purity and horse is strength. So tell me, who's on the white horse? <laughs> what white horse? And go to chapter six, Revelation, verse one. See, this is where Scripture interprets Scripture, and we don't have to end up with confusion. You don't have to go, first of all, to try to figure out what 666 is. That's 666. You'll end up with confusion. But what you want to 
you're going to look here. It says, uh, chapter 6, verse 2, And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. He went out conquering and to conquer. The popular interpretation of the white horse is, who's on it? Antichrist. <laughs> the Antichrist is with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Do, 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 do. You know, look out. He's going to take over and he's going to conquer the earth. But that doesn't line up with scripture, interpret scripture, because it doesn't line up with white and horse, which is pure strength. Antichrist is not pure strength. And go to chapter 19. 19, verse 11 it says, 1911, I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse. <laughs> now, who is on the white horse? Well, he's called faithful and true, his eyes like a flame of fire, clothed with a robe. His name is called the Word of God. Who is the Word of God? Jesus. I mean, is there any doubt? This is Jesus Christ. Now, the white horse in one place, when it's Jesus, can't be, when Jesus Christ, that can't be Antichrist in the other place. Right. Totally inconsistent. Okay? So, from the first mention, I believe that we can follow it all the way through. That's the fifth one here. It's got to be progressive. Mention. Okay? Progressive. In other words, where it's mentioned first, then follow it all the way through the Bible. Precept on precept. Go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Here's the first prophecy in the Bible. Adam and Eve have sinned. But God comes and He pronounces judgment against the serpent. The serpent is? The devil. the devil. And He says, Serpent, your seed and woman's seed are going to be in a battle forever and ever. Verse 15. But her seed, well, you will bruise her seed's heel, but her seed will crush your head. What would you rather have? A crushed head or a bruised heel? In other words, he's, prophes <laughs> he's prophesying that Satan's seed is going to get crushed here. So ever since then, throughout history, the enemy has been fighting against the seed of woman. Okay, now all the way through here, to Abraham, Isaac, you will see the word seed. And he says, to your seed, David's seed, Abraham's seed. Who is the seed? Anybody want Revelation? Okay, go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. The new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. Now to Abraham, Galatians 3, verse 16. And his seed were the promises made. He doesn't say to seeds, many seeds, but of one to your seed, which is Christ. In other words, Jesus is the seed. So all the way through, there is a progressive revelation until the seed of woman came and crushed the serpent's head. That's the prophecy fulfilled. Okay, then we go to comparative mention. And here I'm going to give you some homework. And I want to challenge you because, you know, uh, I'm not here to uh, raise up a bunch of spectators. <laughs> we got to do our footwork. Uh, I want to show you points of resemblance, comparing and contrast in different passages that are parallel. Okay? Let me show you what I mean. Matthew 7. Go to Matthew 7. And in Matthew 7, he says, Ask and it shall be given you. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. And God says, it's a, it, Jesus says, it's the Father's will to give the kingdom to those who ask Him. To give good things. Do you see it there? Verse 11. To give good things. Okay, now go to keep your finger there and go to Luke 11. And in Luke 11, verse 9 to 13, is the same passage. It's a comparative or parallel passage. Ask. Seek, not, but how much more, verse 13, will your heavenly Father give, not good gifts, but give the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, I want you to take this and look over the next week at the kingdom of God. Now, it's the kingdom of God in Matthew, but different passages 
that in Mark and Luke talk about the same thing, they're the same parables, but he talks about the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> is it the kingdom of God or is it the kingdom of heaven? Okay, can you go check it out? We'll find out about the kingdom because as you read the book of Daniel, man, I'm giving you lots of homework, right? How many are hungry? How many are thirsty? <laughs> you won't drink unless you're thirsty. Okay, what's the seventh one? You got all the pieces, putting them all together. It's complete. You get the full picture. And here the full picture is Revelation 11, verse 15. Let's see that. Now I know some people put it all off at the end of time. But in its context, Revelation 11, verse 15, is a present revelation. And he says, the angel of the, the seventh angel sounded. Seventh angel. In other words, God's number, seven, fully, complete, right? He sounded and he said, the kingdoms of this world have become, are the kingdoms of of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Have you got a vision of who's on the throne? Not only in your life, but over all of the world and all of the land, Jew and Gentile together in one covenant. Amen? Amen. Amen.